Section 15 of Little Journeys to the Homes of American Statesmen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Little Journeys to the Homes of American Statesmen by Albert Hubbard. Section 15. Alexander Hamilton, Part 2 hamilton became one of washington's family on march first seventeen hundred seventy seven with the rank of lieutenant colonel he was barely twenty years of age washington was forty seven and the average age of the family omitting its head was twenty five all had been selected on account of superior intelligence and a record of dashing courage when hamilton took his place at the board he was the youngest member save one in point of literary talent he stood among the very foremost in the country for then there was no literature in america save the literature of politics and as an officer he had shown rare skill and bravery and yet such was hamilton's ambition and confidence in himself that he hesitated to accept the position and considered it an act of sacrifice to do so but having once accepted he threw himself into the work and became washington's most intimate and valued assistant washington's correspondence with his generals with congress and the written decisions demanded daily on hundreds of minor questions mostly devolved on hamilton for work gravitates to him who can do it best a simple yes no or perhaps from the chief must be elaborated into a diplomatic letter conveying just the right shade of meaning all with its proper emphasis and show of dignity and respect thousands of these dispatches can now be seen at the capitol and the ease grace directness and insight shown in them are remarkable there is no muddy rhetoric or befuddled clauses they were written by one with a clear understanding who is intent that the person addressed should understand too many of these documents were merely signed by washington but a few reveal interlined sentences and occasional word changed in washington's hand thus showing that all was closely scrutinized and digested as a member of washington's staff hamilton did not have the independent command that he so much desired but he endured that heroic winter at valley forge was present at all the important battles took an active part in most of them and always gained honor and distinction as an aide to washington hamilton's most important mission was when he was sent to general gates to secure reinforcements for the southern army gates had defeated burgoyne and won a full dozen stern victories in the north in the meantime washington had done nothing but make a few brave retreats gates's army was made up of hardy and seasoned soldiers who had met the enemy and defeated him over and over again the flush of success was on their banners and washington knew that if a few thousand of those rugged veterans could be secured to reinforce his own well-nigh discouraged troops victory would also perch upon the banners of the south as a superior officer he had the right to demand these troops but to reduce the force of a general who is making an excellent success is not the common rule of war the country looked upon gates as its savior and gates was feeling a little that way himself gates had but to demand it and the position of commander-in-chief would go to him washington thoroughly realized this and therefore hesitated about issuing an order requesting a part of gates's force to secure these troops as if the suggestion came from gates was a most delicate commission alexander hamilton was dispatched to gates's headquarters armed as a last resort with a curt military order to the effect that he should turn over a portion of his army to washington hamilton's orders were bring the troops but do not deliver this order unless you are obliged to hamilton brought the troops and returned the order with seal intact the act of his sudden breaking with washington has been much exaggerated in fact it was not a sudden act at all for it had been premeditated for some months there was a woman in the case hamilton had done more than conquer general gates on that northern trip at albany he had met elizabeth daughter of general schuyler and won her after what has been spoken of as a short and sharp skirmish 
both alexander and elizabeth regarded a clerkship as quite too limited a career for one so gifted they felt that nothing less than commander of a division would answer how to break loose that was the question and when washington met him at the head of the stairs of the new windsor hotel and sharply chided him for being late the young man embraced the opportunity and said sir since you think i have been remiss we part it was the act of a boy and the figure of this boy five feet five inches high weight one hundred twenty age twenty four talking back to his chief six foot three weight two hundred age fifty has its comic side military rule demands that every one shall be on time and washington's rebuke was proper and right further than this one feels that if he had followed up his rebuke by boxing the young man's ears for sassing back he would still not have been outside the lines of duty but an hour afterwards we find washington sending for the youth and endeavoring to mend the break and although hamilton proudly repelled his advances washington forgave all and generously did all he could to advance the young man's interests washington's magnanimity was absolutely without flaw but his attitude towards hamilton has a more suggestive meaning when we consider that it was a testimonial of the high estimate he placed on hamilton's ability at yorktown washington gave hamilton the perilous privilege of leading the assault hamilton did his work well rushing with fiery impetuosity upon the fort carried all before him and in ten minutes had planted the stars and stripes on the ramparts of the enemy it was a fine and fitting close to his glorious military career when washington became president the most important office to be filled was that of manager of the exchequer in fact all there was of it was the office there was no treasury no mint no fixed revenue no credit but there were debts foreign and domestic and clamoring creditors by the thousand the debts consisted of what was then the vast sum of eighty million dollars the treasury was empty washington had many advisers who argued that the nation could never live under such a weight of debt the only way was flatly and frankly to repudiate wipe the slate clean and begin afresh this was what the country expected would be done and so low was the hope of payment that creditors could be found who were willing to compromise their claims for ten cents on the dollar robert morris who had managed the finances during the period of the confederation utterly refused to attempt the task again but he named a man who he said could bring order out of chaos if any living man could that man was alexander hamilton washington appealed to hamilton offering him the position of secretary of the treasury hamilton aged thirty-two gave up his law practice which was yielding him ten thousand a year to accept this office which paid three thousand five hundred before the british cannon washington did not lose heart but to face the angry mob of creditors waving white paper claims made him quake but with hamilton's presence his courage came back the first thing that hamilton decided upon was that there should be no repudiation no offer of compromise would be considered every man should be paid in full and further than this the general government would assume the entire war debt of each individual state washington concurred with hamilton on these points but he could make neither oral nor written argument in a way that would convince others so this task was left to hamilton hamilton appeared before congress and explained his plans explained them so lucidly and with such force and precision that he made an indelible impression there were grumblers and complainers but these did not and could not reply to hamilton for he saw all over and around the subject and they saw it only at an angle hamilton had studied the history of finance and knew the financial schemes of every country no question of statecraft could be asked him for which he did not have a reply ready he knew the science of government as no other man in america then did and recognizing this congress asked him to prepare reports on the collection of revenue the coasting trade the effects of a tariff shipbuilding post office extension and also a scheme for a judicial system when in doubt they asked hamilton 
and all the time hamilton was working at this bewildering maze of detail he was evolving that financial policy broad comprehensive and minute which endures even to this day even to the various forms of accounts that are now kept at the treasury department at washington his insistence that to preserve the credit of a nation every debt must be paid is an idea that no statesman now dare question the entire aim and intent of his policy was high open and frank honesty the people should be made to feel an absolute security in their government and this being so all forms of industry would prosper and the prosperity of the people is the prosperity of the nation to such a degree of confidence did hamilton raise the public credit that in a very short time the government found no trouble in borrowing all the money it needed at four per cent and yet this was done in face of the fact that its debt had increased just here was where his policy invited its strongest and most bitter attack for there are men to-day who cannot comprehend that a public debt is a public blessing and that all liabilities have a strict and undivorceable relationship to assets alexander hamilton was a leader of men he could do the thinking of his time and map out a policy arranging every detail for a kingdom he has been likened to napoleon in his ability to plan and execute with rapid and marvellous precision and surely the similarity is striking but he was not an adept in the difficult and delicate art of diplomacy he could not wait he demanded instant obedience and lacked all of that large patient calm magnanimity so splendidly shown forth since by abraham lincoln unlike jefferson his great rival he could not calmly and silently bide his time but i will not quarrel with a man because he is not someone else he saw things clearly at a glance he knew because he knew and if others would not follow he had the audacity to push on alone this recklessness to the opinion of the slow and plodding this indifference to the dull gradually drew upon him the hatred of a class they said he was a monarchist at heart and such men are dangerous the country became divided into those who were with hamilton and those who were against him the very transcendent quality of his genius wove the net that eventually was to catch his feet and accomplish his ruin it has been the usual practice for nearly a hundred years to refer to aaron burr as a roue a rogue and a thorough villain who took the life of a gentle and innocent man i have no apologies to make for colonel burr the record of his life lies open in many books and i would neither conceal nor explain away if i should attempt to describe the man and liken him to another that man would be alexander hamilton they were the same age within ten months they were the same height within an inch their weight was the same within five pounds and in temperament and disposition they resembled each other as brothers seldom do each was passionate ambitious proud in the drawing-room where one of these men chanced to be there was room for no one else such was the vivacity the wit and the generous glowing good nature shown with women the manner of these men were most gentle and courtly and the low alluring voice of each was music's honeyed flattery set to words both were much under the average height yet the carriage of each was so proud and imposing that everywhere they went men made way and women turned and stared both were public speakers and lawyers of such eminence that they took their pick of clients and charged all the fee that policy would allow in debate there was a wilful aggressiveness a fiery sureness a lofty certainty that moved judges and juries to do their bidding henry cabot lodge says that so great was hamilton's renown as a lawyer that clients flocked to him because the belief was abroad that no judge dared decide against him with burr it was the same both made large sums and both spent all as fast as made in point of classic education burr had the advantage he was the grandson of the rev jonathan edwards in his strong personal magnetism and keen many-sided intellect aaron burr strongly resembled the gifted presbyterian divine who wrote sinners in the hands of an angry god his father was the rev aaron burr president of princeton college 
he was a graduate of princeton and like hamilton always had the ability to focus his mind on the subject in hand and wring from its very core burr's reputation as to his susceptibility to women's charms is the world's common very common property he was unhappily married his wife died before he was thirty he was a man of ardent nature and stalked through the world a conquering don juan a historian however records that his alliances were only with women who were deemed by society to be respectable married women unhappily mated knowing his reputation very often placed themselves in his way going to him for advice as moths court the flame young tender and innocent girls had no charm for him hamilton was happily married to a woman of aristocratic family rich educated intellectual gentle and worthy of him at his best they had a family of eight children hamilton was a favorite of women everywhere and was mixed up in various scandalous intrigues he was an easy mark for a designing woman in one instance the affair was seized upon by his political foes and made capital of to his sore disadvantage hamilton met the issue by writing a pamphlet laying bare the entire shameless affair to the horror of his family and friends copies of this pamphlet may be seen in the rooms of the american historical society at new york burr had been attorney general of new york state and also united states senator each man had served on washington's staff each had a brilliant military record each had acted as second in a duel each recognized the honor of the code stern political differences arose not so much through matters of opinion and conscience as through ambitious rivalry neither was willing the other should rise yet both thirsted for place and power burr ran for the presidency and was sternly strongly bitterly opposed as a dangerous man by hamilton at the election one more electoral vote would have given the highest office of the people to aaron burr as it was he tied with jefferson the matter was thrown into the house of representatives and jefferson was given the office with burr as vice president burr considered and perhaps rightly that were it not for hamilton's assertive influence he would have been president of the united states while still vice president burr sought to become governor of new york thinking this the surest road to receiving the nomination for the presidency at the next election hamilton openly and bitterly opposed him and the office went to another burr considered and rightly that were it not for hamilton's influence he would have been governor of new york burr smarting under the sting of this continual opposition by a man who himself was shelved politically through his own too fiery ambition sent a note by his friend vaness to hamilton asking whether the language he had used concerning him a dangerous man referred to him politically or personally hamilton replied evasively saying he could not recall all that he might have said during fifteen years of public life especially he said in his letter it cannot be reasonably expected that i shall enter into any explanation upon a basis so vague as you have adopted i trust on more reflection you will see the matter in the same light if not however i only regret the circumstances and must abide the consequences when fighting men use fighting language they invite a challenge hamilton's excessively polite regret that he must abide the consequences simply meant fight as his language had for a space of five years a challenge was sent by the hand of pendleton hamilton accepted being the challenged man for duelists are always polite he was given the choice of weapons he chose pistols at ten paces at seven o'clock on the morning of july eleventh eighteen hundred four the participants met on the heights of weehawken overlooking new york bay on a toss hamilton won the choice of position and his second also won the right of giving the word to fire each man removed his coat and cravat the pistols were loaded in their presence as pendleton handed his pistol to hamilton he asked shall i set the hair trigger not this time replied hamilton with pistols primed and cocked the men were stationed facing each other thirty feet apart 
both were pale but free from any visible nervousness or excitement neither had partaken of stimulants each was asked if he had anything to say or if he knew of any way by which the affair could be terminated here and then each answered quietly in the negative pendleton standing fifteen feet to the right of his principal said one two three present and as the last final sounding of the letter t escaped his teeth burr fired followed almost instantly by the other hamilton arose convulsively on his toes reeled and burr dropping his smoking pistol sprang towards him to support him a look of regret on his face van ness raised an umbrella over the fallen man and motioned burr to be gone the ball passed through hamilton's body breaking a rib and lodging in the second lumbar vertebra the bullet from hamilton's pistol cut a twig four feet above burr's head while he was lying on the ground hamilton saw his pistol near and said look out for that pistol it is loaded pendleton knows i did not intend to fire at him hamilton died the following day first declaring that he bore colonel burr no ill will colonel burr said he very much regretted the whole affair but the language and attitude of hamilton forced him to send a challenge or remain quiet and be branded as a coward he fully realized before the meeting that if he killed hamilton it would be political death for him too at the time of the deed burr had no family hamilton had a wife and seven children his oldest son having fallen in a duel fought three years before on the identical spot where he too fell burr fled the country three years afterward he was arrested for treason in trying to found an independent state within the borders of the united states he was tried and found not guilty after some years spent abroad he returned and took up the practice of law in new york he was fairly successful lived a modest quiet life and died september fourteenth eighteen hundred twenty six aged eighty years hamilton's widow survived him just one half a century dying in her ninety-eighth year so passeth away the glory of the world end of section fifteen section sixteen of little journeys to the homes of american statesmen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by t j p fourteen twenty one little journeys to the homes of american statesmen by albert hubbard section sixteen daniel webster not many days ago i saw at breakfast the notablest of all your notabilities daniel webster he is a magnificent specimen you might say to all the world this is our yankee englishman such links we make in yankee land as a logic fencer advocate or parliamentary hercules one would incline to back him at first sight against all the extant world the tan complexion the amorphous crag-like face the dull black eyes under the precipice of brows like dull anthracite furnaces needing only to be blown the mastiff mouth accurately closed i have not traced so much of silent berserker rage that i remember of in any other man i guess i should not like to be your nigger carlyle to emerson daniel webster those were splendid days tinged with no trace of blue when i attended the district school wearing trousers buttoned to a calico waist i had ambitions then i was sure that some day i could spell down the school propound a problem in fractions that would puzzle the teacher and play checkers in a way that would cause my name to be known throughout the entire township in the midst of these pleasant emotions a cloud appeared upon the horizon of my happiness what was it a friday afternoon that's all a new teacher had been engaged a woman actually a young woman it was prophesied that she could not keep order a single day for the term before the big boys had once arisen and put out of the building the man who taught them then there was a boy who occasionally brought a dog to school and when the bell rang the dog followed the boy into the room and lay under the desk pounding his tail on the floor and everybody tittered and giggled until the boy had been coaxed into taking the dog home for if merely left in the entry he howled and whined in a way that made study impossible but one day the boy was not to be coaxed 
and the teacher grabbed the dog by the scruff of the neck and flung him through a window so forcibly that he never came back. And now a woman was to teach the school? She was only a little woman, and yet the boys obeyed her, and I had come to think that a woman could teach school nearly as well as a man, when the awful announcement was made that thereafter every week we were to have a Friday afternoon. There were to be no lessons, everybody was to speak a piece, and then there was to be a spelling match, and that was all. But heavens, it was enough. Monday began very blue and gloomy, and the density increased as the week passed. My mother had drilled me well in my lines, and my big sister was lavish in her praise, but the awful ordeal of standing up before the whole school was yet to come. Thursday night I slept but little, and all Friday morning I was in a burning fever. At noon I could not eat my lunch, but I tried to, manfully, and as I munched on the tasteless morsels, salt tears rained on the johnny cake I held in my hand. And even when the girls brought in big bunches of wild flowers and corn stalks and began to decorate the platform, things appeared no brighter. Finally, the teacher went to the door and rang the bell. Nobody seemed to play, and as the scholars took their seats, some, very pale, tried to smile, and others whispered, Have you got your piece? Still others kept their lips working, repeating lines that struggled hard to flee. Names were called but I did not see who went up, neither did I hear what was said. At last my name was called. It came like a clap of thunder. As a great surprise, a shock, I clutched the desk, struggled to my feet, passed down the aisle, the sound of my shoes echoing through the silence like the strokes of a maul. The blood seemed ready to burst from my eyes, ears, and nose. I reached the platform, missed my footing, stumbled, and nearly fell. I heard the giggling that followed, and knew that a red-haired boy, who had just spoken and was therefore unnecessarily jubilant, had laughed aloud. I was angry. I shut my fist so that my nails cut my flesh, and glaring straight at his red head shot my bolt. I know not how others may feel, but sink or swim, live or die, survive or perish, I give my heart and my hand to this vote. It is my living sentiment, and by the blessing of God it shall be my dying sentiment independence now and independence forever that was all of my piece i gave the whole thing in a mouthful and started for my seat got halfway there and remembered i'd forgotten to bow turned went back to the platform bowed with a jerk started again for my seat and hearing someone laugh ran reaching the seat i burst into tears the teacher came over patted my head kissed my cheek and told me i had done first rate and after hearing several others speak, I calmed down and quite agreed with her. It was Daniel Webster who caused the Friday afternoon to become an institution in the schools of America. His early struggles were dwelt upon and rehearsed by parents and pedagogues until every boy was looked upon as a possible Demosthenes, holding senates in thrall. If physical imperfections were noticeable, the fond mother would explain that Demosthenes was a sickly, ill-formed youth who only overcame a lisp by orating to the sea with his mouth full of pebbles, and everyone knew that Webster was educated only because he was too weak to work. Oratory was in the air. Elocution was rampant, and to declaim in oratund and gesticulate in curves was regarded as the chief end of man. One-tenth of the time in all public schools was given over to speaking, and on Saturday evenings the schoolhouse was sacred to the debating society. Then came the Lyceum, and the orators of the land, making pilgrimages, stopping one day in a place, putting themselves on exhibition, and giving the people a taste of their quality at fifty cents per head. Recently there had been a relapse of the oratorical fever. Every city from Leadville to Boston has its College of Oratory, or School of Expression, wherein a newly discovered natural method is divulged for consideration. Some of these colleges have done much good. One in particular I know that fosters a fine spirit of sympathy, and a trace of mysticism that is well in these hurrying, scurrying days. But all combined have never produced an orator? No, dearie, they never have, and never can. You might as well have a school for poets, or a college for saints, or give medals for proficiency in the gentle art of wooing, 
as to expect to make an orator by telling how once upon a day sir walter besant was to give a lecture upon the art of the novelist he had just adjusted his necktie for the last time slipped a lozenge into his mouth and was about to appear upon the platform when he felt a tug at the tail of his dress coat on looking around he saw the anxious face of his friend james payne for god's sakes walter whispered payne you are not going to explain to him how you do it are you but walter did not explain how to write fiction because he could not and payne's quizzing question happily relieved the lecture of the bumptiousness it might otherwise have contained the first culture for which a people reach out is oratory the indian is an orator with the natural method he takes the stump on small provocation and under the spell of the faces that look up to him is often moved to strange eloquence i have heard negro preachers who could neither read nor write move vast congregations to profoundest emotion by the magic of their words and presence and further they prove to me that the ability to read and write is a cheap accomplishment and that a man can be a very strong character and not know how to do either for the most part people who live in cities are not moved by oratory they are unsocial unimaginative unemotional they see so much and hear so much that they cease to be impressed when they come together in assemblages they are so apathetic that they fail to generate magnetism there is no common soul to which the speaker can address himself they are so cold that the orator never welds them into a mass he may amuse them but in a single hour to change the opinions of a lifetime is no longer possible in america there are so many people and so much business to transact that emotional life plays only upon the surface in it there is no depth to possess depth you must commune with the silences no more do you find men and women coming for fifty miles in wagons to hear speakers discuss political issues no more do you find camp meetings where the preacher strikes conviction home until thousands are on their knees crying to god for mercy intelligence has increased spirituality has declined and as a people the warm emotions of our hearts are gone for ever oratory is a rustic product the great orators have always been country bred and their appeal has been made to rural people those who live in a big place think they are bigger on that account they acquire glibness of speech and polish of manner but they purchase these things at a price they lack the power to weigh mighty questions the courage to formulate them and the sturdy vitality to stand up and declare them in the face of opposition revolutions are fought by farmers and rail splitters these are the embattled men who fire the shots heard round the world when daniel webster's father took up his residence in new hampshire his log cabin was the most northern one of the colonies between him and montreal lay an unbroken forest inhabited only by prowling indians ebenezer webster's long rifle had sent cold lead into many redskins and the same rifle had done good service in fighting the british once its owner stood guard before washington's headquarters at newburgh and washington came out and said captain Webster, i can trust you ebenezer webster would leave his home to carry a bag of corn on his back through the woods to the mill ten miles away to have it ground into meal and his wife would be left alone with the children on such occasions indians who never saw settlers cabins without having an itch to burn them used sometimes to call and the housewife would have to parley with these savages impressing them concerning the rights of property so here was born daniel webster in seventeen hundred eighty two the second child of his mother his father was then forty-three and had already raised one brood but his mother was only in her twenties it seems that biting poverty and sore deprivation are about as good prenatal influences as a soul can well ask provided there abides with the mother a noble discontent and a brave unrest however it came near being overdone in daniel webster's case for the mrs gamp who presided at his birth declared that he could not live and if he did would alas be a no count but he made a brave fight for breath and his crossness and peevishness through the first years of his life were proof of vitality he must have been a queer toddler when he wore dresses with his immense head and deep-set black eyes and serious ways being sickly 
He was allowed to rule, and the big girls, his half-sisters, humored him, and his mother did the same. They taught him his letters when he was only a baby, and he himself said he could not remember a time when he could not read the Bible. When he grew older, he did not have to bring in wood and do the chores. He was not strong enough, they said. Little Dan was of a like belief and encouraged the idea on every occasion. He roamed the woods, fished, hunted, and read every scrap of print that came his way. Being able to read any kind of print, and not being strong enough to work, it very early was decided that he should have an education. It is rather a humbling confession to make, but our worthy forefathers chiefly prized an education for the fact that it caused the fortunate possessor to be exempt from manual labor. When Daniel was fourteen, a member of Congress came to see Ebenezer Webster to secure his influence at election. As the great man rode away, Ebenezer said to his son, Daniel, look there. He's educated and gets six dollars a day in Congress for doing nothing. While I toil on this rocky hillside and hardly see six dollars in a year. Daniel, get an education. I'll do it, said Daniel, and throwing his arms around his father's neck, burst into tears. The village of Salisbury, where Webster was born, is fifteen miles north of Concord. You leave the train at Boscawan, and there is a rickety old stage with a loquacious driver that will take you to Salisbury, five miles for twenty-five cents. The country is one vast outcrop of granite, and one cannot be filled with admiration mingled with pity for the dwellers thereabouts who call these piles of rock farms. As we wound slowly around the hills, the church spire of the village came in sight, and soon we entered the one street of this sleepy, forgotten place. I shook hands with the old stage driver as he led me down in front of the tavern, and as I went in search of the landlord, I thought the remark of the Chicago woman who, in riding from Warwick over to Stratford, said, Goodness me! Why should a man like Shakespeare ever take it in his head to live so far off? Salisbury has four hundred people. You can rent a house there for fifty dollars a year, or should you prefer not to keep house, but board, you can be accommodated at the tavern for three dollars a week. There are various abandoned farms round about, and they are abandoned so thoroughly that even Kate Sanborn would not have the courage to their adoption try. The landlord of the hotel told me that were it not for the harvest dance, the dance of the 4th of July, and the party at Christmas, he could not keep the house open at all. Of course all the inhabitants know that Webster was born at Salisbury, but there is not so much local pride in the matter as there is at East Aurora over the fact that one of her former citizens is a performer in Barnum and Bailey Circus. The number of old men in one of these New England villages impresses folks from the West as being curious. There are a full dozen men at Salisbury between 75 and 90, and all have positive ideas as to just why Daniel Webster missed the presidency. I found opinion curiously divided as to Webster's ability, but all seem to argue that when he left New Hampshire and became a citizen of Massachusetts, he made a fatal mistake. The sacrifices that the mother and the father of Daniel Webster made in order that he might go to school were very great. Everyone in the family had to do without things that this one might thrive. The boy accepted it all quite as a matter of course for from beyond babyhood he had been protected and petted. At the last we must admit that the man who towers above his fellows is the one who has the power to make others work for him. A great success is not possible in any other way. Throughout his life Webster utilized the labor of others, and took it in a high and imperious manner, as though it were his due. No doubt the way in which his family lavished their gifts upon him fixed in his mind that a moral slant of disregard for his financial obligations, which clung to him all through life. End of section 16. Recording by TJP 1421. Section 17 of Little Journeys to the Homes of American Statesmen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by TJP1421. 
Little Journeys to the Homes of American Statesmen by Albert Hubbard Section 17 Daniel Webster There is a story told of his going to a county fair with his brother Ezekiel, which shows the characters of these brothers better than a chapter. The father had given each lad a dollar to spend. When the boys got home, Daniel was in gay spirits, and Ezekiel was depressed. Well, Dan, said the father, did you spend your money? Of course I did, replied Daniel. And Zeke, what did you do with your dollar? Loaned it to Dan, replied Ezekiel. But there was a fine bond of affection between these two. Ezekiel was two years older, and, unfortunately for himself, was strong and well. He was very early set to work and I cannot find that the thoughts of giving him an education ever occurred to his parents until after Daniel had graduated at Dartmouth, and Dan and Zeke themselves then forced the issue. In stature, they were the same size. Both were tall, finely formed, and in youth slender. As they grew older, they grew stouter, and the personal presence of each was very imposing. Ezekiel was of light complexion and ruddy. Daniel was very dark and sallow. I have met several men who knew them both, and the best opinions is that Ezekiel was the stronger of the two, mentally and morally. Daniel was not a student, while well, Ezekiel was, and as a counselor, Ezekiel was the safer man. Up to the very week of Ezekiel's death, Daniel advised with him on all his important affairs. When Ezekiel fell dead in the courtroom at Concord, and the news was carried to his brother, it was a blow that affected him more than the loss of wife or child. His friend and counselor, the one man in life upon whom he leaned, was gone, and over his own great crag-like face came that look of sorrow which death only removed. But care and grief became this giant, as they do all who are great enough to bear them. It was two years after his brother's death that he made the speech which is his masterpiece, and while the applause was ringing in his ears, he turned to Judge Story and said, Oh, if Zeke were only here! Who is there who cannot sympathize with that groan? We work for others, and to win the applause of senates or nations, and not be able to know that someone is glad, takes all the sweetness out of victory. When I sing well, I want you to meet me in the wings of the stage, and take me in your aims, kiss my cheek, and whisper it was all right. When Patty wrote this to her lover, she voiced the universal need of a someone who understands, to share the triumph of good work well done. The nostalgia of life never seems so bitter as after moments of success. Then comes creeping in the thought that he who would have glorified in this, knowing all the years of struggle and deprivations that made it possible, is sleeping his long sleep. In that speech of January 26th, 1830, Webster reached high watermark. On that performance, more than any other rests his fame. He was 48 years old then. All the years of his career he had been getting ready for that address. It was on the one theme that he loved, on the theme he had studied most, on the only theme upon which he ever spoke well, the greatness, the grandeur and the possibilities of America. He spoke for four hours, and in his works the speech occupies seventy close pages. He was at the zenith of his physical and intellectual power, and that is as good as a place as any to stop and view the man. On the account of his proud carriage, and the fine poise of his massive head, he gave the impression of being a very large man, but he was just five feet ten, and weighed a little less than two hundred. His manner was grave, deliberate and dignified, in his sturdy face, furrowed with lines of sorrow, made a profound impression upon all before he had spoken a word. He had arrived at an age when the hot desire to succeed had passed, for no man can attain the highest success until he has reached a point where he does not care for it. In oratory, the personal desire for victory must be obliterated, or the hearer will never award the palm. Hain was a very bright and able speaker. He had argued the right of a state to dissent from or nullify a law passed by the House of Representatives and Senate, making such law inoperative within its borders. His claim was that the framers of the Constitution did not expect or intend that a law could be passed that was binding on a state when the people of that state did not wish it so. 
Mr. Hayne had the best end of the argument, and the opinion is now general among jurists that his logic was right and just, and that those who thought otherwise were wrong. New England had practically nullified United States law in 1812. The Hartford Convention of 1814 had declared the right. Josiah Quincy had advocated the privilege of any state to nullify an obnoxious law, quite as a matter of course. The framers of the Constitution had merely said that we had better hang together, not that we must. But with the years had come a feeling that the nation's life was unsafe if any state should pull away. Once on the plains of Colorado, I was with the party when there was danger of an attack from Indians. Two of the party wished to go back, but the leader drew his revolver and threatened to shoot the first man who tried to seek safety. We must hang together or hang separately. Logically, each man had the right to secede and go off on his own account, but expediency made a law and we declared that any man who tried to leave did so at his peril. To Webster was given the task of putting a new construction on the Constitution and to make of the Constitution a law instead of a mere compact. Webster's speech was not an argument, it was a plea, and so mightily did he point out the dangers of separation, review the splendid past, and prophesy the greatness of the future, a future that could only be ours through absolute union and loyalty to the good of the whole, that he won his case. After that speech, if Calhoun had allowed South Carolina to nullify a United States law, President Jackson would have made good his threat and hanged both him and Hayne on one tree, and the people would have approved the act. But Webster did not get the case quashed. He only got a postponement. In 1860, South Carolina moved the case again. She opened the argument in another way this time, and a million lives were required and millions upon millions in treasure expended to put a construction on the Constitution that the framers did not intend, but which was necessary in order that the nation might exist. In the Battle of Bull Run, almost the first battle of the war, fell Colonel Fletcher Webster, the only surviving son of Daniel Webster, and with him died the name and race. The cunning of Webster's intellect was not creative, in his argument there is little ingenuity, but he had the power of taking an old truth and presenting it in a way that moved men to tears. When aroused, all he knew was within his reach. He had the faculty of getting all his goods in the front window, and he himself confessed that he often pushed out a masked battery when behind there was not a single gun. Under the spell of the orator, an audience becomes of one mind. The dullest intellect is more alert than usual and the most discerning a little less so. Cheap wit will then often pass for brilliancy and platitude for wisdom. We roar over the jokes we have known since childhood, and cry, Hear, hear, when the great man with upraised hands and fire in his glance declares that twice two is four. Oratory is hypnotism, practiced on a large scale. Through oratory, ideas are acquired by induction. Webster was a lawyer and he was not above resorting to any trick or device that could move the emotions or passions of judge and jury to a prejudice favorable to his side. This was very clearly brought out when he undertook to break the will of Stephen Girard. Girard was a free thinker, and in leaving money to found a college, devised that no preacher or priest should have anything to do with its management. The question at issue was, is a bequest for founding a college a charitable bequest? If so, then the will must stand. But if the bequest was merely a scheme to deprive the legal heirs of their rights, diverting the funds from them for whimsical and personal reasons, then the will should be broken. Mr. Webster made the plea that there was only one kind of charity, namely Christian charity. Gerard was not a Christian, for he had publicly affronted the Christian religion by providing that no minister should teach in his school. Mr. Webster spoke for three hours with many fine bursts of tearful eloquence in support of the Christian faith, reviewing its triumphs and denouncing its foes. The argument was carried outside of the realm of law into the domain of passion and prejudice. The court took time for the tumult to subside, and then, very quietly, decided against Webster, sustaining the will. The college building was erected and stands today, the finest specimen of purely Greek architecture in America 
and the good that Girard College has done and is now doing is the priceless heritage of our entire country. One of Webster's first greatest speeches was before the United States Supreme Court in the Dartmouth College case. Here he defended the cause of education with that grave and wonderful weight of argument of which he was master. In the Girard College case, eighteen years after, he reversed his logic and touched with rare skill on the dangers of a too liberal education. No man now is quite so daring as to claim that Webster was a Christian. Neither was he a freethinker. He inherited his religious views from his parents, and never considered them enough to change. He simply viewed religion as a part of the fabric of government, giving sturdiness and safety to established order. His own spiritual acreage was left absolutely untilled. His services were for sale, and so plastic were his convictions that once having espoused a cause, he was sure it was right. Doubtless it is self-interest, as Herbert Spencer says, that makes the world go round. And thus does sincerity of belief resolve itself into which side will pay most. This question being settled, reasons are as plentiful as blackberries, and are supplied in quantities proportionate in size to the retainer. John Randolph once touched the quick by saying, If Daniel Webster was employed on a case and he had partially lost faith in it, his belief in his client's rights could always be refreshed and his zeal renewed by a check. Webster had every possible qualification that is required to make the great orator. All those who heard him speak, when telling of it, begin by relating how he looked. He worked the dignity and impressiveness of his Jove-like presence to its furthest limit, and when, once thoroughly awake, was in possession of his entire armament. No other American has been able to speak with a like degree of effectiveness, and his name deserves to rank and will rank with the names of Burke, Chatham, Sheridan, and Pitt. The case has been tried, the verdict is in, and recorded on the pages of history. There can be no retrial, for Webster is dead, and his power died thirty years before his form was laid to rest at Marshfield by the side of his children and the wife of his youth. Oratory is the lowest of the sublime arts. The extent of its influence will ever be a vexed question. Its result depends on the mood and temperament of the hearer. But there are men who are not ripe for treason and conspiracy, to whom even music makes small appeal. Yet music can be recorded, and trusted to an interpreter yet unborn, and lodge its appeal with posterity. Literature never dies. It dedicates itself to time, for the printed page is reproduced ten thousand times ten thousand times, and besides, lives as did the Homeric poems, passed on from generation to generation by word of mouth. Where every book containing Shakespeare's plays burned this night, tomorrow they could be rewritten by those who know their every word. With the passing years the painter's colors fade, time rots his canvas, the marble is dragged from its pedestal and exists in fragments from which we resurrect a nation's life. But oratory dies on the air, and exists only as a memory in the minds of those who cannot translate, and then as hearsay. So much for the art itself, but the influence of that art is another thing. He who influences the beliefs and opinions of men influences all other men that live after. For influence, like matter, cannot be destroyed. In many ways, Webster lacked the inward steadfastness that his face and frame betokened. But on one theme, he was sound to the inmost core. He believed in America's greatness and the grandeur of America's mission. Into the minds of countless men, he infused his own splendid patriotism, from his first speech at Hanover when 18 years old to his last when nearly 70. He fired the hearts of men with the love of native land, and how much the growing greatness of our country is due to the magic of his words, and the eloquence of his inspired presence, no man can compute. The passion of Webster's life is well mirrored in that burning passage. When mine eyes shall be turned to behold for the last time the sun in heaven, may I not see him shining on the broken and dishonored fragments of a once glorious union, on states dissevered, discordant, belligerent, on a land rent with civil feuds, or drenched, it may be, in fraternal blood, let their last feeble and lingering glance rather behold the gorgeous ensign of the Republic, now known and honored throughout the earth, 
still full high advanced, its arms and trophies streaming in their original luster, not a stripe erased or polluted, or a single star obscured, bearing for its motto no such miserable interrogatory as what is all this worth, nor those other words of delusion and folly. Liberty first, and union afterwards, but everywhere spread all over in characters of living light, blazing on all its ample folds, as they float over the sea and over the land and in every wind under the whole heavens that other sentiment dear to every true american heart liberty and union now and forever one and inseparable end of section 17 recording by tjp 1421《Section 18 of Little Journeys to the Homes of American Statesmen》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. — Little Journeys to the Homes of American Statesmen by Albert Hubbard — Section 18 Henry Clay — Part 1 if there be any description of rights which more than any other should unite all parties in all quarters of the union it is unquestionably the rights of the person no matter what his vocation whether he seeks subsistence amid the dangers of the sea or draws it from the bowels of the earth or from the humblest occupations of mechanical life wherever the sacred rights of an american free man are assailed all hearts ought to unite and every arm be braced to vindicate his cause henry clay henry clay there is a story told of an irishman and an englishman who were immigrants aboard a ship that was coming up new york harbor it chanced to be the fourth day of july and as a consequence there was a needless waste of gunpowder going on and many of the ships were decorated with bunting that in color was red white and blue what can all this fuss be about asked the englishman what's it about answered pat why this is the day we run you out and the moral of the story is as soon as an irishman reaches the narrows he says we americans while an englishman will sometimes continue to say you americans for five years and a day more than this an irish american citizen regards an english american citizen with suspicion and refers to him as a foreigner even unto the third and fourth generation. No man ever hated England more cordially than did Henry Clay. The genealogists have put forth heroic efforts to secure for Clay a noble English ancestry, but with a degree of success that only makes the unthinking laugh and the judicious grieve. Had these zealous pedigree hunters studied the parish registers of County Derry, Ireland, as lovingly as they have burke's peerage they might have traced the clays of america back to the clays honest farmers indifferent honest of londonderry the character of henry clay had in it various traits that were peculiarly irish the irishman knows because he knows and that's all there is about it he is dramatic emotional impulsive humorous without suspecting it and will fight friend or foe on small provocation then he is much given to dealing in that particular article known as palaver the farewell address of henry clay to the senate and his return thereto a few years later comprise one of the most irish-like proceedings to be found in history there is no finer man on earth than your through irish gentleman and henry clay had not only the highest and most excellent traits of the gentleman but a few also of his worst clay made friends as no other american statesman ever did to come within reach of the snare of his speech was to love him wrote one man people loved him because he was affectionate for love only goes out to love and the irish heart is a heart of love henry clay called himself a christian and yet at times he was picturesquely profane we have this on the authority of the diary of john quincy adams which of course we must believe for even that other fighting irishman andrew jackson said adams's diary is probably correct damn it clay was convivial in all the word implies 
his losses at cards often put him in severe financial straits he stood ready to back his opinion concerning a presidential election a horse race or a dog fight and with it all he held himself personally responsible having fought two duels and engaged in various minor misunderstandings and yet he was a great statesman one of the greatest this country has produced and as a patriot no man was ever more loyal it was america with him first and always his reputation his fortune his life his all belonged to america the city of lexington contains about twenty five thousand inhabitants in lexington two distinct forms of civilization meet one is the civilization of the f f v converted into that peculiar form of noblesse known the round world over as the bluegrass aristocracy bluegrass society represents leisure and luxury and the generous hospitality of friendships generations old it means broad acres noble mansions reached by roadways that stray under wide-spreading oaks and elms where squirrels chatter and mild-eyed cows look at you curiously it means apple orchards gardens lined with boxwood capacious stables and long lines of whitewashed cottages around which swarm a dark cloud of dependents who dance and sing and laugh and work when they have to over against these there are to be seen trolley cars electric lights smart rows of new brick houses on lots thirty by one hundred negro policemen in uniforms patterned after those worn by the broadway squad streets torn up by sewers and conduits steam rollers with an unsavory smell of tar and asphalt push buttons and a hello exchange as to which form of civilization is the more desirable is a question that is usually answered by taste and temperament one thing sure and that is that a pride which swings t'other side and becomes vanity is often an element in both each could learn something of the other lots that you can jump across rented to families of ten with land a mile away that can be bought for fifty dollars an acre are not an ideal condition on the other hand inside the city limits of lexington are mansions surrounded by an even hundred acres but at some of these gates are off their hinges pickets have been borrowed for kindling creeping vines and long grass or top the walls of empty stables and a forest of weeds insolently invades the spot where once nestled milady's flower garden slowly but surely the bluegrass aristocracy is giving way to purslane or asphalt moving into flats and allowing the boomer to plat its fair acres running excursion trains to attend auction sales where all the lots are corner lots and are to be bought on the installment plan which plan is said by a cynic to give the bicycle face just across from ashland is a beautiful estate recently sold at a sacrifice to a man from massachusetts by the name of douglas who i am told is bald through lack of hair and makes three dollar shoes the stately old mansion mourns its former masters all are gone and a thrifty german is ploughing up the lawn that the cows of the douglas tender and true may eat early clover but ashland is there to-day in all the beauty and loveliness that henry clay knew when he wrote to benton i love old ashland and all these acres with their trees and flowers and growing grain lure me in a way that ambition never can no i remain at ashland the rambling old house is embowered in climbing vines and clambering rose bushes and is set thick about with cedars so that you can scarcely see the chimney tops above the mass of green a lane running through locust trees planted by henry clay's own hands leads you to the hospitable wide open door where a colored man whose black face is set in a frame of wool smiles a welcome he relieves you of your baggage and leads the way to your room the summer breeze blows lazily in through the open window and the only sound of life and activity about seems to centre in two noisy robins which are making a nest in the eaves right within reach of your hand the coloured man apologises for them anathematizes them mildly and proposes to drive them away but you restrain him 
after the man is gone you bethink you had the suggestion of driving the birds away was the only white lie of society for even black folks tell white lies and the old man probably had no more intent of driving the birds away than of going himself on the dresser is a pitcher of freshly clipped roses the morning dew still upon them and you only cease to admire as you espy your mail that lies there awaiting your hand news from home and loved ones greet you before these new-found friends do you have not seen the good folks who live here only the old colored man who pretended that he was going to kill cock robin and didn't the hospitality is not gushing or effusive the place is yours that's all and you lean out of the window and look down at the flower beds and wonder at the silence and the quiet and peace and feel sorry for the folks who live in cincinnati and chicago the soughing of the wind through the pines comes to you like the murmur of the sea and breaking in on the stillness you hear the sharp sound of an axe some gladstone chopping miles and miles away your dreams are broken by a gentle tap at the door and your host has come to call on you you know him at once even though you have never before met for men who think alike and feel alike do not have to get acquainted heart speaks to heart he only wishes to say that your coming is a pleasure to all the family at ashland the library is yours as well as the whole place lunch is at one o'clock and george will get you anything you wish and back in the shadow of the hallway you catch sight of the old colored man and see him bow low when his name is mentioned ashland is probably in better condition to-day than when henry clay worked and planned and superintended its fair acres the place has seen vicissitudes since the body of the man who gave it immortality lay in state here in july eighteen hundred fifty two but major mcdowell's wife is the granddaughter of henry clay and it seems meet that the descendants of the great man should possess ashland major mcdowell has means and taste and the fine pride that would preserve all the traditions of the former master the six hundred acres are in a high state of cultivation and the cattle and horses are of the kinds that would have gladdened the heart of clay in the library halls and dining-room are various portraits of the great man and at the turn of the stairs is a fine heroic bust in bronze of that lean face and form hundreds of his books are to be seen on the shelves all marked and dog-eared and scribbled on thus disproving much of that old cry that clay was not a student some men are students only in youth but clay's best reading was done when he was past fifty the book habit grew upon him with the years here are his pistols spurs saddle and memorandum books here are letters faded and yellow dusted with black powder on ink that has been dry a hundred years asking for office or words of gracious thanks in token of benefits not forgot off to the south stretches away a great forest of walnut oak and chestnut trees reminders of the vast forest that daniel boone knew many of these trees were here then and here let them remain said henry clay and so to-day at ashland as at haywarden no tree is felled until it has been duly tried by the entire family and all has been said for and against the sentence of death i heard miss mcdowell make an eloquent plea for an old oak that had been rather recklessly harboring mistletoe and many squirrels until it was thought probable that like our first parents it might have a fall it was a plea more eloquent than o oh, woodman spare that tree a reprieve for a year was granted and i thought as i cast my vote on the side of mercy that the jury that could not be won by such a young woman as that was hopelessly dead at the top and more hollow at the heart than the old oak under whose boughs we set ashland is just a mile south of the courthouse when henry clay used to ride horseback between the town and his farm there were scarce a dozen houses to pass on the way but now the street is all built up and is smartly paved and the trolley line booms a noisy car to the sacred gates every ten minutes lexington was laid out in the year seventeen hundred seventy four 
and the intention was to name it in honor of colonel patterson the founder or of daniel boone but while the surveyors were doing their work word came of the battle of some british and certain embattled farmers and the spirit of freedom promptly declared that the town should be called lexington end of section eighteen section nineteen of little journeys to the homes of american statesmen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b little journeys to the homes of american statesmen by albert hubbard section nineteen henry clay part two three years after the laying out of lexington henry clay was born he was the son of a poor and obscure baptist preacher who lived at the slashes in virginia the boy never had any vivid recollection of his father who passed away when henry was a mere child the mother had a hard time of it with her family of seven children and if kind neighbors had not aided there would have been actual want and surely one cannot blame the widow for marrying for a home when opportunity offered only one out of that first family ever achieved eminence and the second brood is actually lost to us in oblivion henry clay was a graduate of the university of hard knocks he also took several postgraduate courses at the same institution very early in life we see that he possessed the fine eager receptive spirit that absorbs knowledge through the fingertips and the ability to think and to absorb is all that even college can ever do for a man i doubt whether college would have helped clay and it might have dimmed the diamond lustre of his mind and diluted the fine audacity which carried him on his way in this capacity to comprehend in the mass clay's character was essentially feminine we have thoreau for authority that the intuition and the sympathy found always in the saviors of the world are purely feminine attributes the legacy bequeathed from a mother who thirsted for better things from a clerk in a country store to a bookkeeper then a copyist for a lawyer a writer of letters for the neighborhood a reader of law and next a lawyer were easy and natural steps for this ambitious boy virginia with its older settlements offered small opportunities and so we find young clay going west and landing at lexington when twenty years old he requested a license to practice law but the bar association which consisted of about a dozen members decided that no more lawyers were needed at lexington clay demanded that he should be examined as to fitness and the blackberry bush blackstone sat upon him as a coroner would say with intent to give him so stiff an examination that he would be glad to get work as a farmhand a dozen questions had been asked and an attempt had been made to confuse and browbeat the youth when the nestor of the lexington bar expectorated at a fly ten feet away and remarked oh the devil there is no need of trying to keep a boy like this down he's as fit as we or fitter and so he was admitted from the very first he was a success he toned up the mental qualities of the fayette county bar and made the older easy-going members feel to see whether their laurel wreaths were in place when he was twenty years of age he was chosen by the legislature of kentucky as united states senator when his term expired he chose to go to congress probably because it afforded better opportunity for oratory and leadership as soon as he appeared upon the floor he was chosen speaker by acclamation so thoroughly american was he that one of his very first suggestions was to the effect that every member should clothe himself wholly in fabrics made in the united states humphrey marshall ridiculed the proposition and called clay a demagogue for which he got himself straightaway challenged clay shot a bullet through his english-made broadcloth coat and then they shook hands when his term as congressman expired he again went to the senate and served two years then he went back to the house and through his influence and his alone did we challenge great britain just as he had challenged marshall england accepted the challenge and we call it the war of eighteen hundred twelve 
very often indeed do we hear the rural statesmen at fourth of july celebrations exclaim we have whipped england twice and we can do it again we whipped england once and it is possible we could do it again but she got the best of us in the war of eighteen hundred twelve henry clay plunged the country into war to redress certain grievances and as a peace commissioner he backed out of that war without having a single one of those grievances indemnified or redressed after the treaty of peace had been declared and the war was over that fighting irishman andrew jackson irish-like gave the british a black eye at new orleans just for luck and this is the only thing in that whole misunderstanding of which we should not as a nation be ashamed if england had not had napoleon on her hands at that particular time wellington would probably have made a visit to america and might have brought along for us a waterloo and these things are fully explained in the textbooks on history used in the schools of great britain on whose possessions the sun never sets but as henry clay had gotten us into war his diplomacy helped to get us out and as it was a peace without dishonor clay's reputation did not materially suffer in fact the terms of peace were so ambiguous that congress gave out to the world that it was a victory and the exact facts were quite lost in the smoke of jackson's muskets that hovered over the cotton bales later when clay ran against jackson for the presidency he found that a peace hero has no such place in the hearts of men as a war hero jackson had not a tithe of clay's ability and yet clay's defeat was overwhelming peace hath her victories yes but the average voter does not know it the only men who have received overwhelming majorities for president have been war heroes obscure men have crept in several times but popular diplomats never the fate of such popular men as clay seward and blaine is one and when one considers how strong is this tendency to glorify the hero of action and ignore the hero of thought he wonders how it really happened that paul revere was not made the second president of the united states instead of john adams clay was a most eloquent pleader the grace of his manner the beauty of his speech and the intense earnestness of his nature often convinced men against their wills there was sometimes however a suspicion in the air that his best quotations were inspirations and that the statistics to which he appealed were evolved from his inner consciousness but the man had power and personality plus he was a natural leader and unlike other statesmen we might name he always carried his town and district by overwhelming majorities and it is well to remember that the first breath of popular disfavor directed against henry clay was because he proposed the abolition of slavery those who knew him best loved him most and this was true from the time he began to practice law in lexington when scarcely twenty-one years old to his seventy-fifth year when his worn-out body was brought home to rest on that occasion all business in lexington and in most of kentucky ceased even the farmers quit work and very many private residences were draped in mourning memorial services were held in hundreds of churches the day was given over to mourning and everywhere men said we shall never look upon his like again before i visited lexington my cousin little emily duly wrote me that on no account when i was in kentucky must i offer any criticisms on the character of henry clay for if i grew reckless and compared him with another to his slightest disadvantage i should have to fight that he was absolutely the greatest statesman america has produced is to all kentuckians a fact so sure that they doubt the honesty or the sanity of any one who hints otherwise he is their ideal the perfect man the model for all youths to imitate and the standard by which all other statesmen are gauged clay to kentucky scores one hundred and as he was at the last defeated for the highest office which they say was his god-given right there is a flavor of martyrdom in his history that is the needed crown for every hero complete success alienates man from his fellows but suffering makes kinsmen of us all so the south loves henry clay he is so well loved that he is apotheosized and thus the real man to many is lost in the clouds with his name song and legend have worked their miracles and to very many southern people 
he is a being separate and apart like hector or achilles with my cousin little emily i am always very frank and you can be honest and frank with so few in this world of expediency you know we are so frank in expression that we usually quarrel very shortly and so i explain to emily just what i have written here as to the real henry clay being lost she contradicted me flatly and said to love a person is not to lose him you never lose except through indifference or hate i started to explain and has gotten as far as it is just like this when the conversation was interrupted by the arrival of general bellicose who had come to take us riding behind a spanking pair of geldings that i was assured were standard bred in lexington you never use the general term horse you speak of a mare a gelding a horse a four-year-old a weanling or a sucker to refer to a trotter as a thoroughbred is to suffer social ostracism and to obfuscate a side-wheeler with a single footer is proof of degeneracy this applies equally to the ethics of the ballroom or the livery stable in kentucky they read richard's famous lines thus a saddler a saddler my kingdom for a saddler so when i complimented general bellicose on his geldings and noted that they went square without boots or weights and that he used no blinders it thawed the social ice and we were his brothers then i led the way cautiously to henry clay and the general assured me that in his opinion the henry clays were even better than the george wilkes to be sure wilkes had more in the thirty list but the clays had brains and were cheerful they neither lugged nor hung back whereas you always had to lay whip to a wilkes in order to get along a bit or else use a gag and overcheck i pressed little emily's hand under the lap rope and asked her if all kentuckians were believers in metempsychosis colonel littlejourneys is making fun of you general said little emily the colonel is talking about the man and you are discussing trotters and then i apologized but the general said it was he who should make the apology and raising the carriage seat brought out a box of genuine henry clay havanas in proof of amity it's a very foolish thing to smile at a man who rides a hobby once there was a man who rode a hobby all his life to the great amusement of his enemies and the mortification of his wife and when the man was dead they found it was a real live horse and had carried the man many long miles general bellicose loves a horse so does little emily and so do i but little emily and the general know history and have sounded politics in a way that puts me in the kindergarten and i found before the day was over that what one did not know about the political history of america the other did and mixed up in it all we discussed the merits of the fox-trot versus the single foot we saw the famous clay monument built by the state at a cost of nearly a hundred thousand dollars and with uncovered heads gazed through the gratings into the crypt where lies the dust of the great man then we saw the statue of john c breckinridge in the public square and visited various old ebb-tide mansions where the quarters had fallen into decay and the erstwhile inhabitants had moved to the long row of tenements down by the cotton mill my train whistled and we were half a mile from the station but the general said we would get there in time and we did i bade my friends good-bye and quite forgot to thank them for all their kindness although down in my heart i felt that it had been a time rare as a day in june i believe they felt my gratitude too for where there is such a feast of wit and flow of soul such kindness such generosity the spirit understands when i arrived home i found a box awaiting me bearing the express mark of lexington kentucky on opening the case i found six quart bottles of henry clay eighteen eighty one and a card with the compliments of little emily and general bellicose on the outside of the case was neatly stenciled the legend thackeray full set fourteen volumes half levant i do not know why the box was so marked but i suppose it was in honor of my literary proclivities i went out and blew four merry blasts on a ram's horn and the philistines assembled end of section nineteen section twenty of little journeys to the homes of american statesmen this is a librivox recording 
all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b little journeys to the homes of american statesmen by albert hubbard section twenty john jay calm repose and the sweets of undisturbed retirement appear more distant than a peace with britain it gives me pleasure however to reflect that the period is approaching when we shall be citizens of a better ordered state and the spending of a few troublesome years of our eternity in doing good to this and future generations is not to be avoided nor regretted things will come right and these states will yet be great and flourishing letter to washington john jay america should feel especially charitable towards louis the great called by carlyle louis the little for banishing the huguenots from france what france lost america gained tyranny and intolerance always drive from their homes the best those who have ability to think courage to act and a pride that cannot be coerced the merits possessed by the huguenots are exactly those which every man and nation needs and these are simple virtues too whose cultivation stands within the reach of all these are the virtues of the farmers and peasants and plain people who do the work of the world and give good government its bone and sinew to a great degree so-called society is made up of parasites who fasten and feed upon the industrious and methodical if you have read history you know that the men who go quietly about their business have been cajoled threatened driven and often when they have been guilty of doing a little independent thinking on their own account banished and further than this when you read the story of nations dead and gone you will see that their decline began when the parasites got too numerous and flauntingly asserted their supposed power that contempt for the farmer and indifference to the rights of the man with tin pail and overalls which one often sees in america are portents that mark disintegrating social bacilli if the republic of the united states ever becomes but a memory like carthage athens and rome drifting off into senile decay like italy and spain or france where a man may yet be tried and sentenced without the right of counsel or defence it will be because we forgot we forgot in moral fibre and general characteristics the huguenots and the puritans were one the huguenots had however the added virtue of a dash of the frenchman's love of beauty by their excellent habits and loyalty to truth as they saw it they added a vast share to the prosperity and culture of the united states of seven men who acted as presiding officer over the deliberations of congress during the revolutionary period there were of huguenot parentage lorenz boudinot and jay john jay was a typical huguenot just as samuel adams was a typical puritan in his life there was no glamour of romance stern studious and inflexibly honest he made his way straight to the highest positions of trust and honour good men who are capable are always needed the world wants them now more than ever we have an overplus of clever individuals but for the faithful men who are loyal to a trust there is a crying demand the life of jay quite disproves the oft-found myth that a dash of mephisto in a young man is a valuable adjunct john jay was neither precocious nor bad it is further a refreshing fact to find that he was no prig simply a good healthy youngster who took to his books kindly and gained ground made head upon the whole by grubbing his father was a hard-headed prosperous merchant who did business in new york and moved his big family up to the little village of rye because life in the country was simple and cheap thus did peter jay prove his common sense peter jay copied every letter he wrote and we now have these copy books revealing what sort of man he was religious he was and scrupulously exact in all things we see that he ordered bibles from england and also six gross of church wardens which i am told is a long clay pipe that hath a goodly flavour 
and doth not bite the tongue he also at one time ordered a chest of tea and then countermanded the order having taken the resolve to use no tea in my family while that rascally tax is on having a spring of good pure water near my house which shows that a man can be very much in earnest and still joke john was the baby scarcely a year old when the jay family moved up to rye he was the eighth child and as he grew up he was taught by the older ones he took part in all the fun and hardships of farm life going to school in winter working in summer and on sundays hearing long sermons at church we find by peter jay's letter book that johnny is about our brightest child we have great hopes of him and believe it will be wise to educate him for a preacher in order to educate boys then they were sent to live in the family of some man of learning and so we find johnny at twelve years of age installed in the parsonage at new rochelle the huguenot settlement the pastor was a huguenot and as only french was spoken in the household the boy acquired the language which afterwards stood him in good stead the pastor reported favorably and when fifteen young jay was sent to king's college which is now columbia university king's not being popular in america dr samuel johnson who nowise resembled ursa major was the president of the college at that time he was also the faculty for there were just thirty students and he did all the teaching himself dr johnson true to his name dearly loved a good book and when teaching mathematics would often forget the topic and recite ossian by the page instead jay caught it for the book craze is contagious and not sporadic we take it by being exposed and thus it was while under the tutelage of dr johnson that jay began to acquire the ability to turn a terse sentence and this gained him admittance into the world of new york letters whose special guardians were dickinson and william livingston livingston invited the boy to his house and very soon we find the young man calling without special invitation for livingston had a beautiful daughter about john's age who was fond of ossian too or said she was and as this is not a serial love story there is no need of keeping the gentle reader in suspense so i will explain that some years later john married the girl and the mating was a very happy one after john had been to king's college two years we find in the faded and yellow old letter book an item written by the father to the effect that our johnny is doing well at college he seems sedate and intent on gaining knowledge but rather inclines to law instead of the ministry dr johnson was succeeded by dr miles cooper a fellow of oxford who used to wear his mortarboard cap and scholar's gown up broadway in young jay's veins there was not a drop of british blood of his eight great-grandparents five were french and three dutch a fact he once intimated in the oxonian's presence and then it was explained to the youth that if such were the truth it would be as well to conceal it alexander hamilton got along very well with dr cooper but john jay found himself rusticated shortly before graduation some years after this dr cooper hastily climbed the back fence leaving a sample of his gown on a picket while alexander hamilton held the whig mob at bay at the front door cooper sailed very soon for england anathematizing the blarsted country in classic latin as the ship passed out of the narrows england is a good place for him said the laconic john jay so john jay was to be a lawyer and the only way to be a lawyer in those days was to work in a lawyer's office a goodly source of income to all established lawyers was the sums they derived for taking embryo blackstones into their keeping the greater a man's reputation as a lawyer the higher he placed his fee for taking a boy in in those days there were no printed blanks and a simple lease was often a day's work to write out so it was not difficult to keep the boys busy besides that they took care of the great man's horse blacked his boots swept the office and ran errands during the third year of apprenticeship if all went well the young man was duly admitted to the bar a stiff examination kept out the rank outsiders but the nomination by a reputable attorney was equivalent to admittance for all members knew 
that if you opposed an attorney today tomorrow he might oppose you to such an extent was this system of taking students carried that in seventeen hundred sixty eight we find new york lawyers alarmed by the awful influx of young barristers upon this province so steps were taken to make all attorneys agree not to have more than two apprentices in their office at one time about the same time the boston newspaper called the sentinel shows there was a similar state of overproduction in boston only the trouble there was principally with the doctors for doctors were then turned loose in the same way carrying a diploma from the old physician with whom they had matriculated and duly graduated law schools and medical colleges be it known are comparatively modern institutions not quite so new however as business colleges but pretty nearly so and now in chicago there is a barber's university which issues diplomas to men who can manipulate a razor and shears whereas until yesterday boys learned to be barbers by working in a barber's shop the good old way was to pass a profession along from man to man and it is so yet in a degree for no man is allowed to practice either medicine or law until he has spent some time in the office of a practitioner in good standing in the catholic church and also in the episcopal the novitiate is expected to serve for a time under an older clergyman but all the other denominations have broken away and now spring the fledgling on the world straight from the factory several other of his children having sorely disappointed him peter jay seemed to centre his ambitions on his boy john so we find him paying benjamin kissam the eminent lawyer two hundred pounds in good coin of the colony to take john jay as apprentice for five years john went at it and began copying those endless wordy documents in which the old-time attorney used to delight john sat at one end of a table and at the other was seated one lindley murray at the mention of whose name terror used to seize my soul murray has written some good presentable english to the effect that young jay even at that time had the inclination and ability to focus his mind upon the subject in hand he used to work just as steadily when his employer was away as when he was in the office a fact which the grammarian seemed to regard as rather strange in a year we find that mr kissam went away he left the keys of the safe in john jay's hands with orders what to do in case of emergencies thus does responsibility gravitate to him who can shoulder it and trust to the man who deserves it it was in kissam's office that jay acquired that habit of reticence and serene poise which becoming fixed in character made his words carry such weight in later years he never gave snapshot opinions or talked at random or voiced any sentiment for which he could not give a reason his companions were usually men much older than he at the moot club he took part with james duane who was to be new york's first continental mayor governor morris who had not at that time acquired the wooden leg which he once snatched off and brandished with happy effect before a paris mob and samuel jones who was to take as prentice and drill that strong man dewitt clinton before his years of apprenticeship were over john jay the quiet the modest the reticent was known as a safe and competent lawyer kissam having pushed him forward as associate counsel in various difficult cases meantime certain chests of tea had been dumped into boston harbor and the example had been followed by the mohawks in new york british oppression had made many tories lukewarm and then english rapacity had transformed these tories into whigs jay was one of these and in newspapers and pamphlets and from the platform he had pleaded the cause of the colonies opposition crystallized his reasons and threats only served to make him reaffirm the truce he had stated so prominent had his utterances made his name that one fine day he was nominated to attend the first congress of the colonies to be held in philadelphia in august seventeen hundred seventy four we find him leaving his office in new york in charge of a clerk and riding horseback over to the town of elizabeth there joining his father-in-law and the two starting for philadelphia on the road they fell in with john adams who kept a diary that night at the tavern where they stopped the sharp-eyed yankee recorded the fact of meeting 
these new friends and added mr j is a young gentleman of the law and mr scott says a hard student and very good speaker and so they journeyed on across the state to trenton and down the delaware river to philadelphia visiting and cautiously discussing great issues as they went samuel adams too was in the party as reticent as jay jay was twenty-nine and samuel adams fifty-two years old but they became good friends and samuel once quietly said to john adams that man jay is young in years but he has an old head jay was the youngest man of the convention save one when the second congress met jay was again a delegate he served on several important committees and drew up a statement that was addressed to the people of england but he was recalled to new york before the supreme issue was reached and thus through accident the declaration of independence does not contain the signature of john jay in seventeen hundred seventy eight jay was chosen president of the continental congress to succeed that other patriotic huguenot lorenz the following year he was selected as the man to go to spain to secure from that country certain friendly favors his reception there was exceedingly frosty and the mention of his two years on the ragged edge of court life at madrid in later years brought to his face a grim smile spain's diplomatic policy was smooth hypocrisy and rank untruth and all her promises it seems were made but to be broken jay's negotiations were only partially successful but he came to know the language the country and the people in a way that made his knowledge very valuable to america end of section twenty section twenty one of little journeys to the homes of american statesmen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b little journeys to the homes of american statesmen by elbert hubbard john jay part two by seventeen hundred eighty one england had begun to see that to compel the absolute submission of the colonies was more of a job than she had anticipated news of victories was duly sent to the mother country at regular intervals but with these glad tidings were requests for more troops and requisitions for ships and arms the american army was a very hard thing to find it would fight one day to retreat the next and had a way of making midnight attacks and flank movements that to say the least were very confusing then it would separate to come together lord knows where this made lord cornwallis once write to the home secretary i could easily defeat the enemy if i could find him and engage him in a fair fight he seemed to think that it was no fair forgetting the old proverb which has something to say about love and war finally cornwallis got the thing his soul desired a fair fight he was then acting on the defensive the fight was short and sharp and colonel alexander hamilton who led the charge in ten minutes planted the stars and stripes on his ramparts that night cornwallis was the guest of washington and the next day a dinner was given in his honor he was then obliged to write to the home secretary we have met the enemy and we are theirs but of course he did not express it just exactly that way then it was that king george for the first time showed a disposition to negotiate for peace as peace commissioners america named franklin john adams lorenz jay and jefferson jefferson refused to leave his wife who was in delicate health adams was at the hague just closing up a very necessary loan lorenz had been sent to holland on a diplomatic mission and his ship having been overhauled by a british man-of-war he was safely in that historic spot the tower of london so jay and franklin alone met the english commissioners and jay stated to them the conditions of peace in a few weeks adams arrived still keeping a diary in that diary is found this item the french call me le washington de la négociation a very flattering compliment indeed to which i have no right but sincerely think it belongs to mr jay jay quitted paris in may seventeen hundred eighty four having been gone from his native land eight years 
when he reached new york there was a great demonstration in his honor triumphal arches were erected across broadway houses and stores were decorated with bunting cannons boomed and bells rang the freedom of the city was presented to him in a gold box with an exceedingly complimentary address engrossed on parchment and signed by one hundred of the leading citizens jay spent just one day in new york and then rode on horseback up to the old farm at rye westchester county to see his father that evening there was a service of thanksgiving at the village church after which the citizens repaired to the jay mansion one story high and eighty feet long where a barrel of cider was tapped and a gross of church wardens passed around with free tobacco for all john jay stood on the front porch and made a modest speech just five minutes long among other things saying he had come home to be a neighbor to them having quit public life for good but he refused to talk about his own experiences in europe his reticence however was made up for by good old peter jay who assured the people that john jay was america's foremost citizen and in this statement he was backed up by the village preacher with not a dissenting voice from the assembled citizens it is rather curious or it isn't i'm not sure which how most statesmen have quit public life several times during their careers like the prima donnas who make farewell tours the ingratitude of republics is proverbial but to limit ingratitude to republics shows a lack of experience the progeny of the men who tired of hearing aristides called the just was very numerous the progeny of the men who tired of hearing aristides called the just are very numerous of course it is easy to say that he who expects gratitude does not deserve it but the fact remains that the men who know it are yet stung by calumny when it comes their way that fine demonstration in jay's honor was in great part to overwhelm and stamp out the undertone of growl and snarl that filled the air many said that peace had been gained at awful cost that jay had deferred to royalty and trifled with the wishes of the people in making terms and now jay had got home back to his family and farm back to quiet and rest the long hard fight had been won and america was free for eight years had he toiled and striven and planned much had been accomplished not all he hoped but much he had done his best for his country his own affairs were in bad shape congress had paid him meagerly and now he would turn public life over to others and live his own life all through life men reach these places where they say here we will build three tabernacles but out of the silence comes the imperative voice arise and get thee hence for this is not thy rest and now the war was over peace was concluded but war leaves a country in chaos the long slow work of reconstruction and of binding up a nation's wounds must follow america was independent but she had yet to win from the civilized world the recognition that she must have in order to endure jay was importuned by washington to take the position of secretary of foreign affairs one of the most important offices to be filled he accepted and discharged the exacting duties of the place for five years then came the adoption of the federal constitution and the election of washington as president of the united states washington wrote to jay there must be a court perpetual and supreme to which all questions of internal dispute between states or people be referred this court must be greater than the executive greater than any individual state separated and apart from any political party you must be the first official head of the executive and jay as every schoolboy knows was the first chief justice of the supreme court of the united states by his sagacity his dignity his knowledge of men and love of order and uprightness he gave it that high place which it yet holds and which it must hold for when the decisions of the supreme court are questioned by a state or people the fabric of our government is but a spider's web through which anarchy and unreason will stalk in seventeen hundred ninety four came serious complications with great britain growing out of the construction of terms of peace made in paris eleven years before some one must go to great britain and make a new treaty in order to preserve our honor and save us from another war 
franklin was dead adams as vice president could not be spared hamilton's fiery temper was dangerous no one could accomplish the delicate mission so well as jay jay self-centered and calm said little but in compliance with washington's wish resigned his office and set sail with full powers to use his own judgment in everything and the assurance that any treaty he made would be ratified arriving in england he at once opened negotiations with lord grenville and in five months the new treaty was signed it provided for the payment to american citizens for losses of private shipping during the war and over ten million dollars were paid to citizens of the united states under this agreement it fixed the boundary line between the state of maine and canada provided for the surrender of british posts in the far west that neither nation was to allow enlistments within its territory by a third nation at war with another arranged for the surrender of fugitives charged with murder or forgery and made definite terms as to various minor but none the less important questions a storm of opposition greeted the treaty when its terms were made known in america jay was accused of bartering away the rights of america and indignation meetings were held because jay had not insisted on apologies and set sums of indemnity on this that and the other nevertheless washington ratified the treaty and when jay arrived in america there was a greeting fully as cordial and generous as that on the occasion of his other homecoming in fact while he was absent his friends had put him in nomination as governor of new york his election to that office occurred just two days before he arrived and when he landed his senses were mystified by hearing loud hurrahs for governor jay when his term of office expired he was re-elected so he served as governor in all six years the most important measure carried out during that time was the abolition of slavery in the state of new york an act he had strenuously insisted on for twenty years but which was not made possible until he had the power of governor and crowded the measure upon the legislature over a quarter of a century had passed since john adams and john jay had met on horseback out there on the new jersey turnpike their intimacy had been continuous and their labors as important as ever engrossed the minds of men but in it all there was neither jealousy nor bickering they were friends at the close of jay's gubernatorial term president adams nominated him for the office of chief justice made vacant by the resignation of oliver ellsworth the senate unanimously confirmed the nomination but jay refused to accept the place for twenty-eight years he had served his country served it in its most trying hours he was not an old man in years but the severity and anxiety of his labors had told on his health and the elasticity of youth had gone from his brain for ever he knew this and feared the danger of continued exertion my best work is done he said if i continue i may undo the good i have accomplished i have earned a rest he retired to the ancestral farm at bedford westchester county to enjoy his vacation in a year his wife died and the shock told on his already shattered nerves the habit of reticence grew upon him says one writer until he could not be tricked into giving an opinion even about the weather and so he lived out his days as a partial recluse deep in problems of raising watermelons and sheep that would not jump fences he worked with his hands wore blue jeans voted at every town election but to a great degree lived only in the past the problems of church and village politics and farm life filled his declining days to a great degree his physical health came back but the problems of statecraft he left to other heads and hands his religious nature manifested itself in various philanthropic schemes and the bible society he founded endures even unto this day these things afforded a healthful exercise for that tireless brain which refused to run down his daughters made his home ideal their love and gentleness soothing his declining years death to him was kindly gathering him as autumn the messenger of winter reaps the leaves no one has ever made the claim that jay possessed genius he had something which is better though for most of the affairs of life and that is common sense in his intellect there was not the flash of hamilton nor the creative quality possessed by jefferson nor the large all-roundness of franklin 
he was the average man who is trained and educated and made the best use of every facility and every opportunity he was genuine he was honest and if he never surprised his friends by his brilliancy he surely never disappointed them through duplicity he made no promises that he could not keep he held out no vain hopes as a diplomat he seems nearly the ideal we have been taught that the line of demarcation between diplomacy and untruth is very shadowy but truth is very good policy and in the main answers the purpose much better than the other thing i am quite unwilling to leave the matter to those who have tried both we cannot say that jay was magnetic for magnetic men win the rabble but jay did better he won the confidence and admiration of the strong and discerning his manner was gentle and pleasing his words few and as a listener he set a pace that all novitiates in the school of diplomacy would do well to follow to talk well is a talent but to listen is a fine art if i really wished to win the love of a man i'd practice the art of listening even dull people often talk well when there is someone near who cultivates the receptive mood and to please a man you must give him an opportunity to be both wise and witty men are pleased with their friends when they are pleased with themselves and no man is ever so pleased with himself as when he has expressed himself well the sympathetic listener at a lecture or sermon is the only one who gets his money's worth if you would get good lend your sympathy to a speaker and if accidentally you imbibe heresy you can easily throw it overboard when you get home john jay was quiet and undemonstrative in speech cultivating a fine reserve in debate he never fired all his guns and his best battles were won with the powder that was never exploded you had always better keep a small balance to your credit he once advised a young attorney when the first congress met jay was not in favor of complete independence from england he asked only for simple justice and said the middle course is best he listened to john adams and patrick henry and quietly discussed the matter with samuel adams but it was some time before he saw that the density of king george was hopeless and that the work of complete separation was being forced upon the colonies by the blindness and stupidity of the british parliament he then accepted the issue during those first days of the revolution new york did not stand firm as did boston for the cause of independence the foes at home are the only ones i really fear once wrote hamilton first to pacify and placate then to win and hold those worse than neutrals was the work of john jay while washington was in the field jay with tireless pen upheld the cause and by his speech and presence kept anarchy at bay as president of the committee of safety he showed he could do something more than talk and write when tories refused to take the oath of allegiance he quietly wrote the order to imprison or banish and with friend foe or kinsman there was neither dalliance nor turning aside his heart was in the cause his property his life the time for argument had passed in the gloom that followed the defeat of washington at brooklyn jay issued an address to the people that is a classic in its fine stern spirit of hope and strength congress had the address reprinted and sent broadcast and also translated and printed in german his work divides itself by a strange coincidence into three equal parts twenty-eight years were passed in youth and education twenty-eight years in continuous public work and twenty-eight years in retirement and rest as one of that immortal ten mentioned by a great english statesman who gave order dignity stability and direction to the cause of american independence the name of john jay is secure end of section twenty one